Good afternoon. Good afternoon, one and all. As usual, it's a pleasure to be with you. And yes, I know I promised you that I was going to be in the studio today, but I changed my mind at the last minute because I really didn't feel like packing up and going there today. All right. So I decided to do or begin this series, The Mystery of Salvation, ready at my home. And we're going to have a very, 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 very good teaching today. I strongly suggest you equip yourselves with pens, pencils, notepads, electronic devices, whatever it is that you need. We have a whole heap of scriptures as usual that we are going to uh, explain in regards to the mystery of salvation. But before I do that, I have to make good on a promise. All right. And that promise is, I have to advise folks who might not have heard me mention it before, who might not have seen any of my videos on this, and that is about the scammers. And the scammers has dropped to an all-time low to the extent that they are now pushing their books on Amazon. However, they're using my book face cover. So you would see for the only the kindle versions though the kindle versions on amazon only the kindle version of prayers at work i do not own the kindle version i do not i never did one the only thing that i have and i'm going to show it to you that's on amazon i have my prayers that work this one here english prayers that work this is the softback copy then i have it in uh, Spanish, prayers that work. And now I have it in French, prayers that work. These you will find on my website as well as amazon.com. But you will also see on the Amazon link, uh, prayers that work Kindle. That is not me. That is a scammer that is trying to push their book. But this evil worker of iniquity decided to use this Facebook cover on his book and call it prayers that work. Many of you purchase it. Okay. Many of you uh, purchase it and you were disappointed. And some of you were too embarrassed to email me and say to me, uh, I was very disappointed in this book, not realizing that the book is not my book. All right. The, the, and we're talking about the Kindle version. All right, not the softback. The softbacks are quite fine. They're all mine, Spanish, French, and English. All right. So I've gotten an email no longer, no later than this morning. Again, a lady, she had actually uh, snapshot all of the book itself that she got. And I told her to, to write or to report it to Amazon and demand a refund. She said she did it. She did it already. She was, she was very much proactive. And I want you to do the same thing to go on Amazon, those of you who have purchased it, and leave a complaint or report them to let them know that it is a misleading advertisement. It is not press that work Kindle version by Kevin Elioy, even though the cover is saying that. In fact, it's this evil demonic scammer who's doing that, okay? You will be helping me as well as you'll be helping yourself. Now, I see a lot of us like to complain privately among friends, but if you want something to change, then you got to take it to the platform that it's on. So just how you would leave all of those pleasant comments under the reviews for my book, you can leave a review saying how much this uh, person is a deceiver and that this is not Kevin L.A. Ewing and this is not prayers that work by Kevin L.A. Ewing. But you, you have to do it because, like I said, we reach out to Amazon. We made it clear to them. They kind of like give us the run around at first and they had literally took it down. And a day or two later, the guy came right back and put it up again. So it tells me in terms of uh, reviewing, uh, Amazon reviewing what they post on their, their, their uh, platform. I don't think they do a good job at that. Not at all, especially when the original writer, the one who have the copyrights is writing you and telling you, no, this is wrong. This is not me. Okay, and they, they, whatever. So hopefully they will have that down soon. But if you have purchased that, I strongly, and Amazon will refund you your money. And they're gonna, and that's going to put pressure on them to remove this clown because I'm sure they don't get thrills of refunding uh, thousands of dollars. So if you've purchased the book, the, the Kindle version, 
not the softback, the Kindle version of prayers that work, then I strongly suggest to you, go back to Amazon, make a report, make a review, and ask for your monies to be returned back to your credit card or debit card. All right? So I strongly now, for those of you who do not know, I do have the e-book version in Spanish, English, and French, as well as the audio version, Spanish, English, and French, but they're exclusive to my website for this very reason. The forgery on Amazon as it relates to the uh, the eBooks and Kindle and so on. So the only books that I would have on Amazon would be the soft back ones, okay? And they're in Spanish, English, and French. But if you want the audio or you want the eBook version, it's exclusive only to my website, kevinlaoing.com. All right, that's the only way where you any if they're showing up anywhere else, it's another scammer, it's another liar, it's another worker of iniquity. All right, so like I say here, right here in the three versions Spanish, French, and English prayers that work right there can go wrong. I strongly suggest that you go and get a copy. I want to thank every last one of you that has supported. Uh, this project, you have been gracious. Some of you ordered 10 books, some ordered five, six, whatever. And I am very, very grateful, very, very thankful. In fact, it was because of you purchasing so many books that I was able to do the French and the Spanish uh, versions. They were very, very costly. Believe you me, very costly, very <laughs> but I thank you guys who supported me so well in the English version that I was able to put out those other books. And I, and I want to thank everyone that sent me the emails. One lady wrote me and told me she was so happy about the French version because she's getting kind of tired translating it from English to French from for her mother. So she's able to purchase a, a French copy. So I, I really thank God for that. I also want to thank... Uh, Carolyn Green, Caroline Green. Caroline Green is the person who initiated all of this, meaning that I always wanted to do my book. I always wanted to do all that stuff, but I honestly, like now, don't have the time. My my time is so consumed and so limited that I barely have time for myself, honestly, really. Caroline, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, God the Almighty, popped in. And she was the one who made it all happen. She came in with the expertise. She came in with the connection. She came in with everything. And she was able to uh, put everything together for me. She said, Kevin, you just put it, send it to me, do the editing, the format and everything, and we'll take it from there. And she has been a godsend. And I am, I am eternally thankful for her. Uh, she also... Uh, assist with the website and all that stuff there. She she is just incredible. And I thank God for her. She's been a, a blessing. And it's just another reminder to me of what God said in uh, Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the Lord our God who has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings, be it help, be it uh, finances, resources, whatever, it is just a matter of the time for that to be manifested. The only thing we need to be praying for right now is, Father, cause me to be in alignment at the right place at the right time when you introduce me to my blessings that you had in place for me before the foundation of the world. And I truly believe that Caroline Green was one of those former once uh, spiritual blessing that manifested physically in my life to help me with the work. Uh, we're currently working on the finance book. This is going to be very phenomenal, extremely powerful, and it's going to aid many people, no matter which level you are on the spectrum, whether you are finding it difficult to acquire funds, save funds. It is strictly biblically based, showing biblical principles on how to primarily uh, manage resources. It is not a book to make you rich or to become a billionaire. That could eventually become the case in the end if you continue with the rules, right? But ultimately, it'll make you a great steward, a great manager, how to break a poverty or a lack mentality, 
how to address that head on and be intentional about diverting from such a way of thinking, which always guaranteed you a poverty result. So the book is going to be littered with biblical uh, financial principles, uh, so on and so forth, okay? And we have plenty more books on the horizon, all right? So anyway, let's get into this teaching that I've been promising you for a while, all right? I had many of you, when are you going to do the teaching on salvation and so on? And, and, I, and I understand why, because depending on which denomination you're under, you could, I mean, get so many definitions and understanding as it relates to salvation. The first question we want to ask right now, what is salvation? What exactly is it? And why is there a need for it? Is it something that we should worry about now? I mean, is it something that we ought to pay attention to? You better. <laughs> you, you better pay attention. So in this particular series, I should have put the mystery of salvation part one, but I'll correct that later. But anyway, in this particular series, we are going to uh, demystify all of the mysteries and all of the uh, man-made rules. There are many things that we've been taught over the years which has left confusion among many. I remember uh, in my early years uh, in going to church, and there's a particular denomination that we went to, and that particular denomination solely believe that they were the only the only true church there was no other church in terms of preaching the genuine gospel they truly believed that they also believed that once you would have accepted Jesus Christ you were basically incapable of sinning anymore and if you did sin you were never saved to begin with you never truly accepted Jesus Christ so as a result of that Folks like myself uh, spend the majority of our lives uh, uh, not even repenting, but literally going over the uh, coming to Christ exercise, right? So, for example, let's say I got saved last week, and uh, two days later, uh, I said a bad word. So what that meant is I had to go back to the altar again, Okay, not just ask Jesus to forgive me and that's it. No, 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 no. I literally have to ask him to come back into my heart, right? So in hindsight, when I look at it now, I said, boy, Jesus must be extremely athletic because the more of jumping in and out of my heart, he was doing money. He, he should be like, I mean, like the world-renowned athlete of all time. You can imagine just jumping in and out of people's heart every time they they mess up in life. He say, oh, oh, you say the dirty word. Oh, oh, you had lust in your heart. Let me jump out of here again and tell you you're serious about me. Okay, you're serious. Let me jump back in again. So even the thought of that is extremely uh, foolish. And, and this is what happens when you have people who, who took on a hand-me-down gospel, made a doctrine, and then a denomination out of the foolishness. So again, such churches, like I would have said last night, what they do is produce a group of hypocrites because what they're doing is trying to strive for perfection. And they believe that that perfection uh, equates to righteousness. They are, they are righteous through what they do and don't do. So in their mind, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not focused so much on developing a relationship with Christ, what I'm focusing on is that I, I cannot afford to allow my leaders and co parishioners to see me engaging in something that we all know is sinful. Because when I do that, I'm disqualified as a Christian, as a believer of Christ, and now I got to start all over again. So, and I know it was the enemy that infiltrated these people's cerebral cortex and put it there because what that has done, because I became one of what I'm about to tell you right now, I was one of them who said, and I'm sure some of you did this, before I, I get become a Christian, I, I think I'm going to stop cursing. Let me, let me stop fornicating. Once I could get a hold of that, then I think I'll be ready to make that commitment. And that's how I really lived after a while because even I got tired that every time... 
I'm not being asked to repent. I'm being asked to do the whole coming back to Christ all over again because as far as they were concerned, Christ left me because I could not maintain a sinless life, which according to them should have happened the day I said, Jesus come into my heart. So as far as they're concerned, Jesus cannot be in my heart if I'm still lying and fornicating and doing those things. It can't be. So the truth is, in hindsight now, they're all a pack of liars and hypocrites in there because they're claiming, if they haven't changed their doctrine already, of course, because they're all claiming that if they're saying they're Christian, every last one of them and they are perfect, not a one of them have committed a sin since they uh, accepted Christ. Now, here's why that is beyond asinine and stupid. Okay, <laughs> this, this is crazy. Okay, what would be the purpose of the Bible? What would be the purpose of the laws and the rules and principles of God? What would be the purpose is if you uh, confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. What is the purpose of all of that? If the minute I sin, according to these people, I have to go through the whole receiving Christ back into my heart exercise again. It, it makes no sense. So what exactly is salvation? The word salvation, where we get our word saved from, it means to be preserved or rescued from pending danger or even immediate danger or troubles or annihilation. It means to be rescued, exactly. Someone is rescuing me. In the term, in, in regards to Christianity, what we're being rescued from is eternal damnation. All right? Meaning that if there was no Jesus Christ and Jesus didn't become the uh, sacrifice to please God to reconcile us, then we all were hell bound. But before we even get there, let's go back to the Old Testament. Because if I think if I give you it from that perspective and work our way to where we are now, with salvation, I think uh, you would have a greater appreciation for it, okay? Because it's been said so loosely that it has lost its savor, so to speak. But anyway, so back in the Old Testament, before Jesus Christ, uh, death, burial, and resurrection, we had the priests. And the priests, which came from the tribe of Levi, they were responsible for handling all of God affairs in the earth, such as the dealing with the tabernacle, the temple, the ceremonial uh, performances, the feasts, the Passover, all this other stuff, well, not Passover, but all of those other stuff that, that they would do. Now, in the book of Leviticus, there was a ritual that they did for the atonement or the remission of sins. And I, I, I can't remember the fullness of it, but in, in a nutshell, Basically what it was, I think they got like, a, I think a goat and a sheep. And they would, I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I think they would slaughter the sheep. That would be a part of this ritual for the remission of sins. And I think everybody had to put their hand on the goat. And I think this would happen like every year. I think the ending part of the year. And so the transfer of all of the wrongs that they've committed within that year will be passed on to this, I think it's a goat. And then someone will take the goat and take it into the wilderness and let it go. And that will be where that would be the atonement for our sins. So there had to have been like the slaughtering of lambs. Yes, so there had to have been the slaughtering of lambs, all this blood, all the sacrifice to appease God to forgive us for our sins. The problem with that is when we mess up, we'll have to wait until the ending part of the next year to go through this whole cycle all over again. So the truth was, the reason why this was done was because there was no grace. There was none of that then. So everybody back then had to meet the requirements of the laws of Moses that God gave him for his people. So you had to meet the requirements of the sexual laws and the, all of these other laws and rules and principles. Uh, laws such as of a, of a woman hit a man and it's private. There were certain rules that accompanied that. Uh, the law of jealousy, for example, in Numbers chapter 5. And a part of that law is that it says that if the spirit of jealousy descended upon a man and he now began to accuse his wife of cheating on him, he would have to take her down to the priest. And the priest would make this concoction 
And before he give her this concoction to drink, he will ask her, did you or did you not cheat on this man? If she would have lied and drank it anyway, it says that, and, and I am, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, I could be mistaken here, her stomach would begin to bloat, and I think her inner thigh or something like that would swell, or something of that nature. So when we look back over all of these crazy things that went back then, but this is what God required. So the truth is, unlike now, those guys didn't have grace per se. Meaning that when they messed up, they were harshly dealt with by God. Let me give you an example. Remember the Ark of the Covenant, right? And one of the laws was the only, I think, the Levitical priest folks were able to interact with the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody else could touch it, right? And it was, it was being carried one day by the priests and the Levite folks. And while they were carrying it, the ark was tilting to the side, about to topple over. So this guy, I think his name is Uzziah or something like that, in his uh, uh, willingness to prevent it from falling over, he ran up to it and tried to catch it to balance it so that it don't fall over, and immediately he was killed. Struck dead right there. Today, we have homosexuals preaching from God pulpit, uh, pedophiles and so on, and they're still alive. So this is just an example of the grace of God. God is more long-suffering. God is more patient. And this is what real grace is all about. It is not a license to continue in your sin. It is God saying, you know, normally I would have knocked your head right off, but I'm giving you an opportunity to get it right. Those guys didn't have it back then. They didn't. Remember when uh, God told Saul to go and deal with the Amalekites and to kill every last one of them. Saul didn't do it. So God woke uh, Samuel up and told him to go and speak with Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. So he went there and Saul basically lied to him and said he killed everyone and so on. So Samuel said, well, what is this bleeping in my ear? Meaning that I'm hearing sheep and so on. But this was a spiritual thing, right? Anyway, long story short, the Bible says that God told Samuel to annihilate the uh, the king that Saul should have done. And he got his sword and hacked this man to death. This is what the prophet did. What I'm saying to you is that when it comes to salvation, it's more than just being rescued. There's so much more that comes along with it, which I'm about to show you in this series. And it is imperative that you notice because if you don't know these things and you're allowing certain dominations to give you their version of it, you, you, you could be on the way to hell and don't even know it. For example, let me go back. Let me finish up here with Saul. So the Bible says that Samuel told God his sword, and he demanded that the Amalekite or whatever king came, and he literally chopped this fellow to pieces. Literally, which Saul should have done. And all throughout the Old Testament, you're going to come across some harsh, heartless acts by men of God, and even God telling them, to go in and wipe out an entire nation, kill the women, the children, and all that other stuff. So when you read scripture, and if you don't know scripture, you would be challenged when you read that he's an all-loving God, blah, 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 and so on. The, the correlation don't connect because if you are all-loving, why are you so bloody harsh with these people? Why are kids dying? And so on. Well, you make those statements when you don't understand the backdrop or the background. And the backdrop and the background will always be the rules and the laws and principles that he has in place. Let me give you a modern day example. Some parts of the world suffering from major drought. You have women and children, innocent children, bellies baked from bloated with gas and not eaten months and dying skeletal bones. They're basically wrapped up in skin. And one would say, tell me something, where is your all-loving God? Why will he allow something like that? And from the surface, when we don't know the rules, 
be quick to say, that's true, you know. I wonder if God is really real. And imagine someone who was already battling with the reality of God. He'd be like, come on, and if he is real, why didn't he save that person from that accident? Why, why would God look down and watch these two young girls, okay, in their early teens, watching their mother be riddled with cancer? Where is he? Why don't he show up? And it's easy to levy those charges until you come across the rules. See, because the rules now open your eyes. The light bulb, come on. And he is just a God of his word. And he said to them from day one, I said it to you last night, in uh, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, Moses said to the children of Israel, he says, listen, let uh, heaven and earth stand as a witness against you in this day. I have given you, uh, I've given to I've presented to you life and death. Now he's talking about the laws, the rules, and the principles of God. He says, I've given you life and death, blessings and curses. Please choose life, listen carefully, so that you and your seed or your children may live. So Moses is saying, depending on how you handle the law, will not just determine your outcome, but it becomes infectious. It will now work its way into the lives of your future generation. So when we look over here and we say, my God, look at this place, be it whatever country it is. And you're just looking at the surface. But now let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go into the communities. And now what do we see? We are finding that they, that they serve other gods. We find idolatry. Okay, now let's take that scenario and now let's go back to the Bible. And everywhere where we saw idolatry, we saw famine, we saw sickness, confusion, we saw war, we saw backwardness, all of these things that we see. But the uninformed sees the surface. My God, where's your God now? As if God is doing this to them. When Moses says, now you choose. And notice though, when you choose, you are literally speaking for you and your future generation. So the, the past, the ancestors who choose darkness, this is the penalty being levied to the future generation. So you can't blame God for that. You can't blame him for that. What you should be blaming is those who didn't have any respect for his rules. I'm trying to help you. See, nobody, the only time people want credit and to, when, when things are going good, when things begin to go downhill, no one wants to levy the responsibility that I'm a part of this. I caused this. There were decisions that I made that was in uh, contrary to the word of God. And like I said, the Bible is a book of laws, rules, and principles. As such, because of that, it now also become a book of rewards and penalty. If I do what it says, I will be rewarded. If I oppose and rebel against it, not only will there be penalties for me to pay, but by extension, my seed or my children, grandchildren, and so on and so forth. In fact, he even promised down to the third and fourth generation. So now with that said, look at certain countries that are going through total chaos, but don't just look at the surface that they're fighting. Look at who and what they serve what rules and laws spiritually that they apply or, or, or live by. And now you're going to see, you're going to see the core of why all of what is visible or the tentacles now where, that root, where the root is. The root was embedded in idolatry, which simply means that they were opposing God and serving something else, which in other words, to serve something else, you're inviting other forces, spiritually that is. So poverty, sickness, confusion, uh, anti-government, all of these things are kicking in now. So fast forward now to the arrival of Jesus Christ. So God says, okay, because of what Adam did in the garden, because that's what started all of this off, Adam did, Adam disobeyed God, all right? And as a result of what him and his wife did, it caused the collapse of the authority and dominion that God initially gave mankind. And the enemy literally took it away from them. All right? The enemy became the God of this world. He wasn't supposed to rule this world, but that happened. When, and basically, the best way to put it is power changed hands when 
Adam obeyed the devil. And this is why I say in my teachings, the scriptures are very clear. There's no gray area. It isn't that I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the devil. It, it cannot work that way. Okay? The truth is, when I do the will of God, I'm in an agreement with God. When I do the will of the enemy, by just by rebelling against the word of God, I don't even have to be in partnership with the devil. The minute I rebel against the word of God, I am in partnership with the devil. So there's no gray area. So what Adam did, it brought damnation on all of us. And this was the reason for the Mosaic laws and rules and principles. This was the reason for all of that. So God, Holy Spirit and Jesus came up with this brilliant plan to now reconcile man back to God, to bring back what he originally intended from the garden. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is because mankind, no matter how much they attempt to do my laws, could never be perfect at it. They could never do every rule without committing a sin, without violating it. It's impossible for them. In other words, their righteousness could never reach the requirement to satisfy God. All right? Now, with that said, with that said, let's go into some scripture because I want to lead up to my point. So let's go. Let's go here. Where's my thing? Let's go here to Isaiah 64 and 6. Okay? So it's all about righteousness now. And back then, they had to fulfill the law to be righteous. So you will see certain things that uh, when Moses did X, Y, D, or, or X, Y, Z, or Abraham, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Okay? So there were certain parts of the law that they did, and it became a credit for them. However, it was not sufficient, okay, to please God to the extent that they become overall righteous, meaning sinless or whatever. That was unable to be achieved. Okay? So in Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah. Here we go. Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah, some say Isaiah. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato, don't matter. Okay? Isaiah 64 and verse 6. All right? 64 and 6, that's it, right? But we are all as unclean things. And all our righteousness, all of our righteousness, talking about the human beings now, all our righteousness at maximum are as what? Filthy rags. You hear that? So, fast forwarding to the church today. <sighs> It doesn't matter what you do. You might say, Kevin, I don't smoke. I don't drink. Liquor has never touched these lips. I've never cheated. I've never had sex. I was celibate from I was born. I'm now 999. And I have never used a curse word before. Now, you are saying the things that you are aware of. But there are many sins you would have committed and don't even know. You don't even notice. For example, Jesus said, it was said of old, do not commit adultery. Okay? And that simply meant then that you must not have sex outside of your marriage or have an affair with nobody else. But he said, I say to you that any man that looks upon a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery in his heart already. So while I might not have physically engaged intimately with this person as a married man. Jesus now broadened the scope of that. He says, if you if you sit back and look and fantasize on what and how you are going to deal with this, he says, you are equivalent to the guy who is right on the couch with a woman that is not his wife, engaging in physical intimacy with her. You, you are on the same part, same level. So the point I'm making here is, while you don't smoke, you don't drink, you've never done fornication, you've never, none of that. But there are things that you're not aware of, dealing from a hard perspective now that your heart did 
that made you a violator of the law. But because of the big ticket sins that you're aware of that you know you're not doing, you feel that you are complete in achieving, not breaking any of the laws, and that's not so. So we see where Jesus now, especially with the New Testament, you are not only judged on the act, but the intent. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you today. So he says here, our righteousness could never qualify us for eternal life. Never. So you might as well smoke cigarette and drink liquor and go fornicate if you feel they were the only requirements to get you in heaven. He said, even if you would have fulfilled those things, that's what he says, but we are all as unclean things and our own and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and thy iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So he says, at your best in trying to live right and trying to achieve complete salvation on you, he said, at your best, God look at it as filthy rags, meaning that you could never satisfy God with your own righteousness to achieve eternal life in his kingdom. It could never happen. So now you're seeing why we need something to redeem us. What, what will become the sacrifice? What will please God that he will be so satisfied? What will he put in place that if we follow this particular protocol, he says, okay, now you're, you're good now. You're justified now. Well, this is where Jesus Christ comes in. Now, this is what the true definition of salvation is. Because prior to all of this, prior to Jesus, we were bound for eternal damnation. We were, by, we were going by the old system in the Old Testament. We had to wait every year for this dude to come back around to do this ritual to atone our sins. So what happened for those who died before he come back around and they got some sins pending? <laughs> yeah, I got some uh, lustful sins going on over here. I mean, he coming in December. Boy, and this only September. Boy, you better hurry up because... My heart failing. This diabetes putting a licking on me. I don't know if I can make it until December. So we, we, we need a contingency plan up in here. <laughs> so you see, even in that scenario, you're running a risk. Because you're not guaranteed you're even going to be around for when this dude come to do the ceremony for us to put our hand on the goat and them taking out into the wilderness, which they call the scapegoat and all that other stuff. We, we're not even sure of that. But this is where Jesus Christ comes in. So Jesus Christ becomes this redeemer. He becomes the one who's going to reconcile us back to God. Because the deal is, Jesus Christ says, okay, God, I got this perfect plan. Here's what I'm going to do. Rather than sacrificing goat and sheep and all this stuff for the remission of sin and atonement, let me, your only begotten son, become the ultimate sacrifice to expunge all possible sin. Sin now yesterday, today, and forever. Let me let me remove that all together, and I'm going to volunteer to give my life for humanity, me who is sinless, me who know no form of sin, never committed it, but I am willing to become a ransom for humanity so that they can escape the peril of eternal damnation. God says, I like that. He said, but here's the catch, though. And I accept that, Jesus, but here's the catch. Even though you're about to do something that will expunge all sin from everyone, nobody's exempted. The protocol is, though, they have to accept and believe who you are. Meaning that you're going to do the act, and I'm going to be satisfied. But for them to come and receive eternal life, they have to believe in their heart that you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. They have to confess to their mouth. That's the only thing they need to do. But they must genuinely believe it. And as a result of that, there's no more washing and cutting goats up and all that. There's no more of that. They will now be, if they are genuinely saved, they are sealed 
until the day of redemption. So God sent Jesus into the world. And the purpose of Jesus is to reconcile us. In other words, amend the relationship between us and God. And that's going to come through receiving him. Now, let me be clear here before we go any further, because this is where the misconception comes in. And I spoke about this a lot last night. People believe, again, this is what happens when you sit under man-made doctrines. And man-made doctrines are people who become full of pride and now begin to add and take away from the Gospels. This is where problems come in. And this is why I, I don't believe in denominations. Jesus Christ never started it. It was never... Uh, I don't believe in it. If I don't believe, I, to me, denomination breeds confusion because you have some denomination who believe in a resurrection, some who don't, some who believe in, in, in this foolishness, like everybody trying to create their own thing. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're a Baptist, Methodist, whatever, I ain't knocking you for that. Do, do you. For me, I am non-denominational. I don't believe in none of that. I believe in the Bible. So if I had to give my covering a title in terms of a building, it will be the Bible. That's what I believe. Okay. So you have some people, like I said, that church who said that they basically had a perfect church and you become perfect once you get saved. If you mess up that you were never saved then you have to go through all that process all over again. Uh, then you have uh, the all inclusion, Carlton Pearson. Carlton Pearson says that he believed that Jesus Christ did die at some point, but the truth, but what he also believes is that Jesus Christ died for all humanity. And his uh, dominating scripture was through one man sin entered the world and through, that would have been Adam, and the second Adam, which is known as Jesus Christ, through him all sin was forgiven. So Carlton Pearson believed that you don't have to accept Jesus Christ. This was a part of his gospel inclusion. You don't have to accept Jesus Christ as clearly stated in Scripture. Instead, the mere fact that Christ died for all, everyone will go to heaven. There's many problems with that. Because all throughout the New Testament, the requirement to reconciliation with God and eternal life is very clear. In fact, abundantly clear. And it's all about believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that in my heart, and now I'm confessing that with my mouth. So he says, this is what happens. Now I am saved. See, this is key. Saved from what, though? I'm saved from the peril, the destruction, the ruin, the eternal punishment that was pending if I didn't receive the free gift of salvation, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. Carlton said, you don't have to do that. If you're a homosexual, a murderer, a pedophile, there is no penalty. You could live how you want to live, do whatever you want to do. There's no reason to accept this Jesus stuff because Christ has already died. Now, a lot of people who enjoy their sinful lifestyle bought into that. And a lot of them now are spreading the tentacles of what he started, which is so tragic. And they believe that they can do what they want to do. They can have multiple partners, they can have a homosexual church. They could do those things because God is love. And they're like Mr. Pearson would have said, he could not wrap his head around the fact that an all loving God will punish you eternally. But he isn't punishing you eternally, sir. He gave you choices and you choose the choice that will give you eternal punishment. Nobody forced it on you. You choose that. And Mr. Pearson, right up to his death, I hope he changed it, or up to his death was propagating and pushing this nonsense. And many people bought into it. But if you look at the quality of people that bought into it, are those who already had their alternative lifestyles and living how they want to live. It seemed to be a very convenient gospel, meaning that I can enjoy the pleasures of sin and still go to heaven because according to the man of God, Jesus died for everybody. And there's no need to accept Jesus when he would have cleansed everybody of their sin. And that is not true. So let's look at another scripture. Let's go to the book of John, the book of John chapter 3, all right? And let's look at verse 16, because we want to debunk with Mr. Pearson and many other, they call it universalism teachings that they teach, because they teach that stuff. So the book... The rule book says, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world 
that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. So they're now carrying out the agreement that the God had made. We're going to deliver Jesus unto humanity to be sacrificed only to please God to reconcile, condemn mankind back to him. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen, listen, that whosoever, no matter who you are, no matter which tribe you come from, which culture, doesn't matter, that whosoever believe in him shall do what? Shall not perish, but what? But have everlasting life. So what we see here, we see a stipulation. We see a condition. Did Jesus Christ die for everybody? Yes. The sinner, the homosexual, Kevin, you, the pedophile, the rapist, the murderer, the whomever, even the reprobate mind. Jesus died. When he did, when he died on that cross, when he was crucified, when the thorns were placed on his head, when he was spat upon, beaten, towed his own cross, the spear was shoved in the side on the cross, nailed to the cross. He did that with the mindset that every human being that will ever exist on this planet, I'm doing this for them. But he says, while I would have done my part, according to the contract in the heavens, at the conference table with God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, the deal is here now, they must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to become a beneficiary of what Jesus has done. So he said in John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world, I love the world so much, and want to reconcile them back to me based on the error in which Adam done. He says, I gave my only begotten son. I gave him up as a sacrifice. And the deal is, whosoever believe in him shall not perish. But what's going to happen? You will get eternal life. You will live in the kingdom of God forever. But it's hinging on your belief. Not the idea that Christ died and I don't have to do anything. That's erroneous teaching. Now, either Carlton Pearson is wrong or God is wrong. Carlton Pearson never wrote no books. So I'm not listening to him. I listen to the scriptures. So what Mr. Pearson was doing was adding and taking away from the gospel. And according to uh, Galatians 1, 8 and 9, it says, let such a person be cursed. So verse 17, he says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved, rescued from what? Eternal damnation. Okay then, Kevin, if that's the case now, okay, it's kind of making sense now. So what was I prior to accepting Jesus Christ? I know everyone is going to say, I know, I know, I was a sinner. Well, we all sinners to be honest with you, even the ones who are saved. I mean, if you want to be correct here, I am a sinner, but saved by grace. And I don't want to jump ahead myself, I'm going to get there. But there's another labeling. Yes, I am a sinner. Prior to accepting Jesus, yes, I was a bona fide sinner. But there's another label though. There was another, because saying that I'm a sinner doesn't give the true essence of who I really was prior to accepting Christ. Because I was in a very, very terrible state. Everyone who don't know Jesus. Let's look at verse 18. Well, let's go back to verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn. And this is key. Circle that. It's not about condemning. This free gift of salvation is such a beautiful thing that we, we're not trying to attract you to it by condemning you. In fact, we want to point out the love, the, the goodness, the, 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 the pleasure of it in terms of now and even the life to come. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, meaning his son, might be what? Saved or rescued. That's what salvation means. Verse 18, because it's going to tell me what I was prior to accepting the free gift of salvation. He that believe, saying it again, on him, the person that believe on Jesus, is not condemned. This is key. This is one of the beautiful components of salvation and the acceptance of it. Why? Well, let's continue to read. But he that believeth not is what? Condemned. That's what I was. I was condemned before I accepted Jesus Christ. So what does that really, really mean, Kevin? Well, let's look at it for what it's saying. The condemned person will not spend eternity with Christ. That's if they were to die in their sins or Christ came and met them unsafe. So condemn meaning that you have now 
uh, signed on basically to eternal, perpetual torment. There's no rescuing of you anymore if you refuse the only way to the Father. So he says, you are condemned. So any one of you listening to me right now, and you are not a Christian, I don't care how much you listen to praise and worship music on Sunday. I don't care how much when you hit hard times, you go grab your Bible and read it. I don't care how much you fornicate and a little guilty feeling hits you and you say, Father God, uh, forgive me for what I have sinned and God, uh, forgive me. You're wasting time. Because if you're doing all of that, but never accepted the free gift of salvation, you are condemned. And if you die, you will spend eternity in torment. So he says in verse 18 of uh, John 3, he says, He that believeth, this is key, this is what Carlton Pearson never told anybody, he said nothing about you believing. He says, because Christ died, you are automatically grafted into the, the body of Christ, which is garbage. Because what he's saying is that everybody is a Christian. Every pedophile, every murder, every fornicator, every liar, every human being, everyone is a Christian. Everyone is a child of God. Everyone. That's what he's saying. Because if the, cause, cause the, the caveat or the prerequisite is, I must accept the offer, which is the free gift of salvation. He said, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed, that's the key word, in the name of the only begotten son. The only begotten son. I remember I was watching TBN one time, Paula White and this gentleman, I can't remember his first name, but the last name was, I think, Huck, H-U-C-K, right? Uh, he claimed to have been on drugs years ago and God turned his life around and he was preaching now and doing well. And I used to listen to him. Some things he was making but made a lot of sense. But anytime I walk, anyway, anyway, this time I saw him in Paula White. And as usual, they're trying to raise money, so they pump you up. And he said that Jesus Christ is not the only begotten son. And he further went on and Paula is agreeing with him. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And he further goes on to say that because we are all begotten of the Father and Jesus is not the only one. The Apostle Paul said to the Church of Galatians in Galatians chapter 1, he says, if anyone in my entourage, even if an angel appear to you, preaching anything other than what we are preaching here, let that human being, let that person become a curse. This is scripture. See, I'm, I'm breaking this down to you because I need you to let your Bible become the final say to you. That no matter what Kevin say or any other of your favorite preachers say, if, if you can't show me the way you're explaining this, if you can't show me this exactly how the Bible says, because Kevin, you're telling me that salvation requires me accepting the only plan that God put in place to reconcile to him. Now show me that in scripture, which I am doing to you right now. And that's how you should be. Because I cannot take the advice or counsel from someone who's prideful, arrogant, and believe they are at the peak of Christianity and whatever they say I must believe. When what we're grappling with here is my eternal life. So what happens if I go with what you say and die and find out that you were wrong? Can I say, okay, God, I realize now, Mr. Pearson and everybody else, they made a mistake. Now, you know, I didn't know no better, so you might as well let me go back to earth, get it right, and now you could send me in your kingdom. No, no. You made a choice. Whether you didn't look at the scripture, whether you didn't prove, it doesn't matter. You had a copy of the manual, which is the Bible. You decided to go along with this person. It's your choice. You can't blame God. You can't blame me. You, you can't even blame, blame Mr. Pearson. Because the book that he denied and said wasn't the 
infallible and it was not the unadulterated word of God. And this is why I don't know why people listen to him. The man comes right back and preach and quote from the very book. He is telling you it's not the infallible word of God. <laughs> Boy. I, I don't, to me, it has to be a spell. It has to be some, some sorcery over somebody's mind. This man is outright denying the scriptures. He said that the Bible has been revisited and, and re-edited or whatever over 4,500 times or 45,000 times. Okay? And it is not the infallible word of God. It is man's opinion about God and so on. But yet you are quoting scriptures and teaching from it. But you pick out what you don't like. I don't. He says he don't believe in a hell. He don't believe in eternal damnation. He don't believe I have to believe in Jesus to be accepted into the body of Christ. So who is this guy? To take the manual of God, the only policy. I have fools say this all the time. They don't believe in the Bible because man wrote it. Well, show me the book the aliens wrote for you. Show me the book the spirits wrote for you, because I want to see that. I want to see a book where no hands wrote. Show it to me. Because here it is, people regurgitating ignorance. What do you mean? I am not going to read that because that's the white man book, and it's a book about slavery and so on. Okay, you know what? You may be right. Now, show me the authentic book then. Show me the book that does not speak about slavery. Show me this book that clearly... The, the original rule book. Show it to me. You can't. So what is the basis of your argument? So what do you guide your life by? What are the morals and rules for your life? Tell me. Show me it. Show me. Show me the book. Go and say, Kevin, you see this book here? You see this book right here, right? You see this? Now, this is what I was trying. I didn't want to tell you in front of everybody because I know they might have laughed because they don't, they don't know how deep I am. But you see this book here? One night, four spirits break in my room, kick my door down, tie me up, Put a blindfold on me. And the spirits wrote this. No human wrote this. So everything you see in here, Kevin, spirits. Yeah, that's right. So show it to me. You give me your stupid asinine reasoning by telling me you don't read the Bible. You don't believe the Bible because man wrote it. Who else supposed to write it? Tell me. I, tell me. I, I won't believe your ignorance, right? I want to make provisions for your stupidity. So therefore, convince me. Who should have, who wrote it? Who was supposed to write it? Tell me. Make me understand. Because that is not an argument. That's like you saying to me, listen to this. Let me, let me ask sick these people are. Okay, you you don't believe this book that is telling you your wife cheating on you is wrong and is trying to teach you how to be faithful and how, how to be faithful so that y'all could be exclusive and there'll be no infidelities and so on. This book is telling you how to be honest. Don't lie to one another. Be honest. Be upfront. Don't fornicate. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. You say, yeah, I don't believe because man wrote it. But watch this, watch this. But man built that aircraft over there that somehow goes at great speed down a runway lifts in the air and could follow the air because a man built it. So why are you not afraid to fly in that aircraft that could follow the sky? Because a man built it. But you don't believe this book because man wrote it. Well, what is this? <laughs> what is, no, 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 no. That's it for me. I'm done. No, that's it. That's it. I've had it. No, I've had it. That's it. You're saying to me, you're willing to risk your life to take this flight that is five hours built by human beings. You trust this plane so much that you are entrusting your life for the next 11 hours, 11 and a half hours from Atlanta to Nigeria, over the Atlantic Ocean. You're trusting your life in that. But this book right here, which is telling me to be a good person, I don't believe this book because man wrote it. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know if I should be laughing or crying. I don't, I don't get it. I'm confused. <laughs> this is what you call rehearse stupidity. Stupid. Ignorant. Ignorant. It makes absolutely no sense. You take a train across the country on this little truck, this thousands of tons on this little truck, which man made. And you're willing to entrust your life for the next four hours to get to your destination. You trust that. But this book over here that tells you 
uh, to follow certain rules to get a good beneficial result, but you don't believe that book. Why? Because man wrote it. And not just man, the white man wrote it. <laughs> Lord, I tell you, I, I just give you the glory. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 it, that makes no sense. I don't, boy, I tell you. The Bible says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those who are lost, in whom the God of this world had blinded their minds, not their eyes, blinded their minds. Because you're telling me that, and you know how stupid it sounds, but you still look at me straight square in my eye. I, I don't believe in that because man wrote that. Right. You go on a cruise on this ship which is small in size compared to the vast ocean with thousands of miles of seawater underneath it that could topple over at any point because man made it and you're willing to go on your honeymoon for the next seven days on that ship through rough weather and everything. Man built the boat, but you refuse to accept the Bible because man wrote that. I will never get that. I will. It, that is, I don't know. I don't even know how to label that. <laughs> that that is the I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know. So let's go to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five. This is crazy. Let's go to Second Corinthians. I don't believe the Bible because man wrote it. But I will take a flight for the next twelve hours in the air, even though man built that. Hmm. Wow. Second Corinthians chapter five. And let's look at verse 21. So listen to this. So it says, For he had made him to be sin. Who is he? God. God made Jesus to become sin. The sin and the penalty that we all carried and burdened with, God says, the deal is I'm going to dump all of that on Jesus because he's going to become the ultimate sacrifice. So in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 12 it says, For he had made him, God had made Jesus, to be sin for us. Jesus who knew no sin, listen why he's doing it, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, so let's break that down so we can get some clarity here. Jesus was sinless, and remember the plan of the Godhead was Jesus will become the sacrifice, and being the sacrifice, he will take the penalty that was pending for us. He will take on all of our sin, all of that. He's going to He's gonna do all of that. That's his part, right? But then we read something here that was kind of challenging though, because it says Jesus did all of that so that we might be. That was kind of confusing there. So let's read it again. For he had made, God had made Jesus to become sin for us. Jesus who knew no sin, right? That we might, circle that word, because it sounded like, is not sure that we might be made the righteous. Now, why is the word might then? Why does it sound like it's nothing guaranteed? Well, it debunks what Carlton Pearson said. That's why the might is there. Might meaning that while Jesus would have done his part, might only comes in depending on if you do yours. And what would be your part? Accepting the free gift of salvation, accepting what Jesus did to be reconciled. So that's why he said might, meaning that you don't have to accept it. So you won't get eternal life, and you will remain condemned. So for those of you that followed Carlton Pearson teaching inclusion, read that for a second. So basically it's saying it's not automatic that because of what Jesus did, I'm saved. I am saved when I accept the offer made to me based on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's how I'm saved. That's how it works. So he says now, listen carefully though, he says, for he, which is God, had made him, which is Jesus, to be sin for who? Us. Who knew no sin. Jesus did know no sin. And the reason why they're doing all of this, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So let's use me. So I've accepted the free gift. I believe it. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. I believe that he's the only begotten son. I believe that he became the ultimate sacrifice for us. As a result of that, there will be no more shedding of lambs and bulls. There's no more going through, no priest or nobody else to get to Jesus. According to Hebrews, I can now 
come boldly before the throne of grace and make my petitions towards him. I don't have to go through no preacher, no pastor, no apostle, no pope, nobody. Every human being have that access to, to, to God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because what Jesus did and when I accept the free gift of salvation, this is where it becomes beautiful again. Not only am I now guaranteed eternal life, but the qualifier of me uh, being guaranteed eternal life is that the minute I accepted Jesus, and this is the beautiful part, instantaneously I became righteous. And not any kind of righteous. The one where God is satisfied for me to enter into eternal life with, with God and the Godhead. What? So, Kevin, it's kind of a little confusing. So, let's say you accepted Christ right now, right? And you didn't accept all the force. You really want to be right with God. You, This is what you want. And two weeks later, you slept with your girlfriend. Well, those who create their own gospel and doctrine outside of the Bible, you are not saved anymore. You have rejected Christ. As far as they're concerned, you lost your salvation. See, the problem here is, <laughs> this is where it becomes interesting. <sighs> Even though you accepted Jesus Christ, it was a very simple thing to do. You believed in your heart, you confessed it your most, you are not saved it becomes very difficult now to lose your salvation. Oh, oh, open up a can of worm now. You open up a can of worm, oh yeah. You see, contrary to popular belief, accepting Jesus Christ is a simple thing to do in terms of truly believing from your heart and you are inducted into the, the membership of the body of Christ. You're cursing, you're lying, and you're stealing. After that, does not push you out. You see, the Bible has many amendments for that sin. First uh, John 1 and 9 is one of them. He says, listen, if you confess your sin, Kevin, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I'm, I, Kevin, I am pro your salvation. I want you to make it in. I've made it very simple for you. Let me be clear now, Kevin. I am not encouraging you in your sin, you know. I'm showing you the provisions to get it right because what he's now saying, he's saying what the majority of churches do not tell you. And what is that? Being saved isn't a one-time thing. It, it, what, it, what I mean by that is when I accept Jesus Christ, it's progressive. What do you mean by that? that, that what are you saying to me? Okay. When I accepted Jesus Christ, most definitely, instantaneously, two things has happened. I've been inducted into the group of eternal living. So if I die, I will go to live forever with Christ. Secondly, all of this happened instantaneously. I became righteous. No effort of my own, nothing that I did. I didn't stop smoking, drinking. In fact, I'm still battling some of those things when I accepted Christ. Probably, excuse me, still smoking a cigarette and trying to quit. I don't want to do this. But now that the Holy Spirit lives in me, doing those things, I'm not comfortable anymore. Because there's a conviction. This is what the Holy Spirit comes in. Now, his job is to guide us into all truth, remind us of the things Christ has said, to convict us of sin. So while I'm smoking the cigarette, I'm saying to myself, I don't want to do this. I shouldn't be doing this. But of course, we're creatures of habit. You've been doing it for a while. So it's just customary that you go and do it again. You've been fornicating with your boyfriend or girlfriend. After a while, you tell him, I don't, I don't want to, I don't feel right having sex with you anymore. What do you mean? I'm your boyfriend. I'm your woman, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I don't want to live like this anymore. That's the conviction. That's the Holy Spirit. But Kevin, they still save? Of course they still save. Kevin, if they die, they'll go to heaven? Of course they'll die and go to heaven. Why shouldn't they go to heaven? Did you re read the requirement? They, they followed the requirement. They believe. And that's the reason why they're acting upon the person whom they wor once worked along with with their sin. They don't feel that way though anymore. They're not comfortable in their sin anymore. I can't do this anymore. What do you mean you can't do this no more? We've been doing this. You tripping? What would happen? I cannot, for whatever reason. No, it ain't no whatever reason. The Holy Spirit would not allow me to do this anymore. It's the Holy Spirit is now. That's why I said salvation is progressive. So there are many of you who accepted Jesus Christ, 
and you went right back to fornicating or well not went right back you continued and you abandon Christianity. You say, I'm not safe anymore. I can't live like this. I can't do this. I obviously the same for me because I like having sex and I, I like being me. I see because you were taught that once you accepted Christ, all of those things are going to go away from you. You were never told that salvation is progressive. The word progressive means ongoing, continuous. And this is where the scripture comes in about working out your own salvation. So, Kevin, okay, I got you. So, tell me then, Kevin, can a person lose their salvation? Absolutely. But, Kevin, you ain't making sense. Okay, if you tell me I can lose my salvation, but then you just tell me I got saved and I go back to having sex or continue having sex, but I'm still saved. I, you ain't making no sense. No, okay, let me explain it to you then. Okay, so how does a person lose their salvation? Because you don't lose your salvation by committing a sin. It's, it's not that simple. Losing your salvation is literally denying the Godhead, denying everything about what you originally believe. And not just denying it, but you're living according to what you believe in terms of your denial of Christ. Let me give an example. When you accepted Jesus Christ, there was no pressure on you, or there shouldn't have been no pressure on you. You made a free choice. You know, I think it's time I get my life together. I feel convicted. I can't live like this anymore. Father, would I come before you asking you to forgive me of all of my sins? I repent of all wrongdoings and violations of your law. Now, Heavenly Father, I'm asking you to come into my heart. I truly believe that you're the Son of God, and I receive the free gift of salvation right now. By faith, I don't need to see no evidence. By faith, I believe I am saved right now. So, Father, I confess with my mouth that you, Jesus, our Lord, you are the only begotten Son. Boom, you are saved. So two minutes later, somebody call you and they run you sort on the phone. You say, F you. I don't give a blah, 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 F you. Is that person still saved? Yes. Are they still sanctified? Yes. Are they still justified? Yes. Are they still glorified? Yes. Says who? Says the Bible. So before we get there, so how can I lose my salvation? Very simple, because there are some preachers who say that it's impossible for you to lose your salvation. It is not impossible. It's difficult, but it's not possible. So how do we lose our salvation? The same way you accepted Jesus Christ. He didn't bully you. You did it as a, a choice you made. There are people who come to the conclusions, I've met a few of them, who don't believe in God anymore, who don't believe the Bible, and they renounce Christ, just like you would renounce a fraternity, renounce whatever. I don't believe in Jesus, Kevin. It's a waste of time. Jesus is an imaginary thing. Those things are not real. The stories in the Bible are allegories. They're not true. So if you're saying that a person cannot lose their salvation, here is what you're actually saying. You're saying that even if you want to leave Christianity, Jesus will bully you into heaven. You ain't going nowhere. You can't come out of this like this. No way. I'm not going to accept your renunciation of me. I'm not going to accept the fact that you don't believe in me. You, whether you believe it or not, Jesus Christ, me, I'm going to bully you. That's what you're saying. So to lose my salvation means that I want nothing to do with Jesus anymore. Forget him. I don't believe in this stuff. It's all uh, stories and it, it, it isn't real. That's losing my salvation. Another way to put it, remember what Jesus said. He said in the scriptures, he said, there are many on that day that will come to me that will say, Lord, Lord, haven't I done X, Y, Z in your name? And he's going to say to these people who would have lost their salvation, don't even realize it. He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So who would be these people? Let's go back to the guy that I told you last night, to Carlton Pearson funeral, the gay pastor who has a husband who introduced and gave kudos to his husband right there on stage. People like him who has lost their salvation. Now, they will tell you they're saved because they're a preacher and there's certain things that they don't do anymore. No, listen, Jesus pre-qualifiers. He said, there are those who are going to come to me on the day of judgment like this gentleman right here, right? And he's going to say, God, I preach and I, I want souls to Christ and blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is going to say, could you kindly leave my presence? I never knew you. And listen how he labeled him as to why he said, he said you work of iniquity. And I said to you last night what iniquity was. It is the abuse of sin. It is something that I realize is wrong. It's a sin, but I've justified it now and says, you know what? I love this man, even though he's the same sex, 
and God is love, and I grab all kinds of scriptures to pretty it up, and now I make it a doctrine. So Jesus has now labeled him as a worker of iniquity. You're defying my laws. So he says, on that day, you've lost, you've lost your salvation a long time. On that day, when you come to me now and say, well, Lord, I see everybody going to heaven. Why are you on this road over here? And he says, because you are a worker of iniquity. You refuse to give up. You became comfortable and made gospels out of your doctrine that was contrary uh, to the word of God. You've justified it. You've preached error to my people. The book of Revelation, I think, said that anyone that add or take away from the word of God, let his or her name be removed from the book of life. That's not like someone losing their salvation to me. Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go, because a lot of people are looking at that man who I just, I can't remember his name. But anyway, the gay pastor. Everybody look at him and say, oh, that man, he's a reprobate, which is true. He going to hell. But not just him. Not just him. And, and again, these are all the progressiveness of salvation and all that it encompasses. Okay, now watch this. Let's go here now to, I can show you something very deep right now. Let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 1, right? Romans chapter 1. All right? And let's look at, let's start from verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hold the truth is that I, I am claiming to believe in God, but I have a gay partner. I hold on to this. All right? Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God had shown it unto them. So God said to them, what the Bible is saying is that all throughout their life, God was saying to them, this is wrong. This is not right. But they hardened their heart. All right? Let's drop all the way down to verse 32. That's what I want to get to. Verse 32 of Romans 1 says that these people who would have committed to these particular sins, adultery, fornication, lying, whatever, he says, they are fully aware that they will be punished. Listen, listen the wording here. So verse 32 of Romans 1, who knowing the judgment of God, meaning those who are doing these things, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. They know this. No matter what they preach, no matter how much they say that God loves what they're doing, they know deep within. That's why I tell you, don't follow, you, you stop calling these people, you're covering all, these people are living hypocritical lives. They're telling you, you're a spiritual orphan and they're, they're, you're the, they're, they're your spiritual fathers and mothers. And here it is, there's some sins that they're being convicted of, but refuse to deal with it. And you're putting yourself under them. Watch this. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, Listen, listen. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So let me put that in layman's terms. So what we are saying is that the gay pastor who was at Carlton Pearson funeral, and he introduced his husband, the first gentleman. And I listened to the Christians. Hey, nobody picked up and left. Nobody renounced that and said, I'm not going to be a part of this. What that scripture just said. This is the progression of salvation. These are the do's and don'ts. He said, not only is that pastor aware that what he's doing is wrong and it is worthy of death, but according to what we just read, even those that encourage them or enable them in doing these things. Right, that's scripture. So Kevin's supposed to be the, the big teacher. Okay, and he goes to this church and everybody in here doing their own thing. And he's just sitting there like, you know, well, I guess that's them. No, God says, if you don't challenge this, if you, because silent gives consent, if, if you endorse this, be it silently or publicly, if you make no mention that this is wrong, he says, not only are they aware that there's a punishment and a penalty that comes along with their error, but also you will be equally judged and dealt with as if you've done the same thing because you enable, because you encourage them, because you support them. I did a teaching called Be Careful Who You Follow, where I went in more detail on what I'm talking about right now. 
scripture. It's not my opinion. So many of you would be out there, well, don't, well, I mean, come on, if they love each other, it isn't a matter of who love who. We're looking at which is sin that you've accepted and pampered and fed, and it's now a iniquity. And Jesus said, the reason why I'm telling this preacher, go to hell. The reason why I'm telling this faith healer, because they did heal, go to hell. The reason why I'm telling this man, who has won many souls for the kingdom, go to hell. Because the qualifier, they are workers of iniquity. They have become comfortable, satisfied, and committed to doing wrong. No repentance, no none of it. So they lost their salvation and didn't even know. And if you want to know how come they lost their salvation, well, in order, the salvation become the prerequisite to go to heaven, right? To have eternal life, right? So clearly if you ain't going there, I mean, you lose it, right? It's not my opinion, man. It's scripture. Nobody can drag me to hell with their beliefs. I don't care what you believe, but continue believing what you believe. You ain't going to change my mind. You ain't going to drag me to hell with you. If you're comfortable doing what you're doing, buddy, I pray that one day you will come to the light. Just like I prayed for Mr. Pearson repeatedly, that one day you would come to light. But your arrogance, your pride, your, your selfishness in you willing to put other people's lives at risk and drag them to hell with you because of your selfishness, because I love the same sex. And now let me make a doctrine out of it and make everybody comfortable in their sin. When I would have read, Jesus said, listen to the ones that came to him because they were so confused. Why is it that I'm going to eternal damnation when I would have done all of the things religiously that you require? And he said to them, you work up of iniquity. The Bible says in Psalm 66 verse 18, listen to what it says. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. So that means all the time the man was preaching and God said, and God said, and people got saved. People actually accepted Jesus Christ because the message resonated. The Holy Spirit convicted him and they accepted God. And this man went souls to the kingdom of God. But the Bible says when he went to pray and said, God, forgive me, God, blah, 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 or forgive me my sins. If we regard iniquity, presumptuous, rep repetitious sin in where? In our heart. God will not hear us. That's what I read. That's what I read. Let's go to another one. Let's go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. And let's look at uh, verses 1 to verse 2. Listen to what it says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. So why didn't God intervene into my affairs when I needed him the most? Why didn't why did God ignore me when I was crying out him out, out to him the most? Verse 2 is going to explain it. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Iniquity is going to bring a separation on the day of judgment. Yeah, Kevin, you was a good teacher. Many people got, they, they created their own ministries because they were inspired by you. They wrote books and was inspired by you. But you remain in your iniquity, Kev. Therefore, depart from me. Thank you for your services. But that place over there called heaven, mm -mm, ain't nothing happening over there. You could take a look at it, but you wouldn't be going up in there. But he didn't end there. He said, and those who supported you, those who live a double life. Yeah, Kevin. Now, I know they saying that ain't right, but let God judge you. I, I sticking with you, Rev. Or oh, you sticking with Rev. Okay. Well, I hope you have prepared for the penalty that comes along with sticking with Rev, who defied the word of God and preached another gospel talking mess so let's go here now to let's go here now to Ephesians chapter 2 <clears throat> let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 and we're going to read from verse 8 to verse 9 Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to verse 9 for by grace the mercies and the favor of God that's what grace is are we are you saved through faith so what does that mean that simply means that, number one, the, the, the entire 
salvation ordeal is favor from God. God didn't have to do any of that. Men rebel against him. That's his recreation. He could have just annihilated them immediately. But because he loved us so much, he made provisions for us to get it right again. And that's why the Bible is very clear. There can be no other sacrifice. There can be no other way to Jesus Christ. It's one way. One way. I don't know why people are trying to create other ways. Why are you trying to make it so difficult? So what he's saying is that you are saved by grace through faith. So what I mean is that, okay, when I accept Jesus Christ, this is a favor from God. But I may not feel saved when I got saved because it have nothing to do with a feeling. I may not look saved when I got saved. But I have nothing to do with a look. You see the word, you are saved by grace through faith. And faith simply means, what it means again, what I always tell you, not just believing, but believing in God. So I must believe that I am saved. But Kevin, I just don't feel safe. So how, how, how it is when you feel safe? What do you get? Cold bumps, chills? What? You got acne, break out? What, what happens? So I need to know. And then show me in the scripture that uh, a person, if they want to be sure that they're safe, there's a certain chill or feeling or something. Show to me. You're not going to see that. Being safe have everything to do with your belief in God. I believe. That's the bottom line. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son. I accept that. I accept the free gift of salvation. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I repent and apologize for every violation, every breaching and infractions that I've done of his rules. Lord, forgive me. I'm asking your forgiveness right now. I am set for glory. I, if I die right now, I will go to heaven and spend eternal life with Jesus. So let's get back now. Let's get back now to this, right? Let's go. So by grace, we are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, meaning that it has nothing to do with you living right and you qualified for, 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 for salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. Listen, listen. It is the gift of God. So for those of you who are not saved as yet, you are condemned. Let's be clear, according to the Bible. Uh, John 3, verse 18. But more importantly, you have rejected the free gift of salvation. That's what it is. The Bible says here that it is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift from God. We don't deserve it. Listen, verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Child, one thing with me. I don't wear weave. I don't see these people around here. They got the devil all up in their brain, putting on these people, wigs and stuff. That's the demons. He says, you sound stupid. Because what you're trying to do now, you're trying to equate the works of God, that you were able to receive it based on you not wearing weave, based on you not smoking cigarettes, based on you not fornicating, based on you not lying. You are saying that the reason why God had to give me salvation was because of me living right. Foolish. It's an ignorant statement. Got nothing to do with you, but everything with what Christ has done for you. You, in other words, you're receiving something you didn't work for. So get out of here with that foolishness. Get out of here. Get, 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 get. Out of here with that nonsense. So you see now you have to go back and relearn so much stuff because many of you are in churches intimidated. You are intimidated. That man has threatened you. If you leave here, you will lose your salvation. You will never prosper. You will, as if, because he's so great before God, he have the power to snatch what God gave you freely. Mighty God. But this is what happens when you don't read your Bible. This is when what happens when you sit under uh, narcissist psycho sociopaths. Th this is what happens right here. And you, you, you live not a Christian life, an intimidating life. Oh, Lord, you got to be careful. You know, Rev coming. So what if he coming? I hope he's safe. <laughs> Talking nonsense. No, and this is in no way to disrespect. Or no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, hey, look, your salvation is a gift. Salvation is something that was created by the Godheads and is now being offered to us as human beings. Here, yeah, this is you. Don't allow no preacher or Kevin or nobody get between you and your eternal life. Don't let temporary pleasures, which are fading away, get between you and eternal life. You, that's why the Bible says, shall a man gain the whole world and lose his one soul or reject the gift of salvation, all be for, for a three-minute orgasm, 
all because of a poison you're worshiping in their youth because she's pretty, her chest is out there, she got the shape. So what's going to happen when she's 80? Is it still worth your soul? <laughs> Boy, you better get it right. Look at what you're, you're, you're gambling. Look at what you're putting on the line. But I know why you're doing that because until now, you don't know the gravity of what you were delaying or you gave up. You didn't know the true consequences of which you, you just hear, okay, there's a hell and there's a heaven. As if, okay, I can go through that for a while and then I can be okay in the hell thing. Eternal damnation. All right? So I love this. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I remember a lady in church I used to go to and uh I remember, uh, anyway, I used to do the Bible studies there every Tuesday night. And this one lady, <laughs> she was such a funny lady. Anyway, we were having, like, after all of my teachings, I do a question and answer period. And when she got up, well, actually, she got up to refute a, a, a question that was asked. And she started off by telling the other, the young lady, because this woman was in her 60s, early 60s. So she tell this young lady, she had to be like 35, something like that. So she tell her, well, anyway, I'll answer that because I'm more saved than you are. You're more saved than this poison. How, how, how do you become more saved than another poison? Are there levels and tears of being saved? So right there, Right there, they're turning the gift of God into a competition. <laughs> you see this? I am more saved than you. What does that come with? Years or age? I mean, I, I want to know. what what. How can you be more saved? I mean, what is the ceiling? I mean, let me, I, I need to know because I've never came across any scripture that uh, spoke to that. So how do you become more saved? I'm confused. It's foolish. It's nonsense. You cannot be more saved than another poison. You can be more experienced than them. But if you save, you are saved. It's a free gift of God. It's, you see, again, and again, I don't condemn them. But, but what I see is a level of thinking. And the level of thinking that I see here, they're still putting salvation in the category of works. I've been at this longer than you, so I have more salvation strength than you. I am more salvation, uh, more ranked than you are in salvation. How is that? <laughs> this foolishness, man. How could you be more saved than another person? All right? Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. I like this one. Romans chapter 3. And let's begin at verse 21. Listen to what it says. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. <clears throat> being witnessed by the law and the prophets, verse 22 of Romans 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, listen, listen, unto all and upon all them, what is the criteria? That believe, Mr. Pearson, that believe. Not because Jesus is sacrificed that makes me righteous. I must believe. If I believe, I become righteous. He says, however, though, the righteousness is for everybody, everyone, Satanists, every one of y'all, you have access to the righteousness of God. You don't have to work, which would have been a waste of your time, to be righteous. Jesus Christ died for everyone. And if you want to achieve eternal life, you have to believe in him who became the sacrifice. Very clear. There's no two ways about it. And I just can't see how Mr. Pearson, who preached the gospel for so many years, how was he able to miss this? Arrogance, pride. You believe you're smarter than God. You, 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 because certain things in the Bible don't sit with you, you create your own uh, supplementary gospel. Uh-uh. No, man. No, I am not going to listen to you. Let's go to Second Peter. Let's go to Second Peter. And let's look at chapter 3, verse 9. Listen to what it says here. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering 
to us would, not willing, meaning that it is not his will, that any should perish, listen, but that all should come to repentance. All will give up their sinful nature, their condemned nature, and accept this gift of salvation that him and the Godhead has made possible for us to avoid a penalty that we don't have to pay anymore if we accept Jesus. So the Bible is saying, God God is saying, listen, it, I don't get glory and joy watching people hurled into hell. That is not my will. My will is that everyone will repent. The scripture, it's not my opinion. Let's go to Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Listen to what it says. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. <coughs> so when people touting this banner that they were saved for 968 years and there are certain sins that they never committed, so what? <laughs> what, what does that mean? Let me show you something. Okay, so you've been saved for 89.3 million years, right? Okay. This guy just came to the altar. He said he want to give his life to Christ. He goes through the ritual, confess, believe in his heart, renounce, repent of his sins, whatever. By faith, I am saved. You all are on the same level. Because save is save. What we're trying to achieve here is eternal life. You don't get special brownie points. You don't get an, addiction, an additional eternal life. An eternal life is eternal life. So God is saying, listen, listen, the, you've been saved for six million years. You don't smoke. You don't drink. But what righteousness has done has made us all level, meaning that it is in your righteousness by not smoking and drinking that make you more safe and righteous than the guy who just signed on 20 minutes ago. This is the beauty of righteousness. It makes the, the playing field level because it has nothing to do with you. It is the finished works of the cross. It is the finished works of Christ, Jesus Christ, because of what he has done. You were incapable as a human to achieve the necessary righteousness, to qualify for eternal life. So Jesus Christ had to step in. So when you talk nonsense about you are more saved than another person or you could wipe the milk from off your mouth because you just come on board here and I've been saved longer than you. So what? So what? So what? <laughs> it makes no sense. So when we understand what we're dealing with here now, we're better to navigate in our walk of salvation and what we signed on to as Christians. So let's read this again. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He says, not by works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So it was when we accepted Jesus Christ, we were reconciled to God. We became righteous. Watch these benefits. We have been assured eternal life. He says in John 14 or 16, somewhere around there, he says, listen, guys, I have to leave now. I can't be here with you any longer. I have to go and do what I came here to do. But when I leave, I will not leave you, the believers, comfortless. I will send you the comforter. And what is going to be his role, Mr. Jesus? Well, primarily, he's responsible for leading you into all truth. He is supposed to remind you of the things that I have said. He is supposed to convict you of sin. So when I leave, the Holy Spirit is going to be the one to assist, to aid, and to guide you. He's going to tell you what is right and what is wrong, what you need to be doing. So you've got to pay close attention to what he's saying, not what some person who created their own gospel is saying. All right? Let's go to... Uh, Colossians, all right? Let's go to Colossians chapter 13, verse 14. And again, all I'm showing here is what took place when by faith you accepted the free gift of salvation. 
whoever I'm talking to right now, if you do not know the Lord as your Savior or you've been on defense about this, let me tell you what's really happening with you. You're basically skating on thin ice. What that simply means is that at any moment, that ice can break and you plunge into the abyss with no coming back. When the the and, and the thing about it, you're not losing anything. And I know you might be saying, but Kevin, I don't know, man. Kevin, I can be real with you. I got some stuff going on in my life. I don't think I'm prepared to be saved right now. And I don't, I, I can't agree with you, my friend. Because what you're risking here is eternal torment in exchange for a temporary thing that you're going through. And I don't care how vile it is. You may be a pedophile. You may be a liar, a cheat. You may be a wife right now who have three children and none of those children belong to your husband, but he believed that there is. And you may say to me, Kevin, I don't know, man, because if that means if I become a Christian right now, I got to tell this man this and I can lose everything. No, my friend. See, because you're thinking, remember, you, you, you're taking on power. You're taking on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is going to guide you through this. What I'm saying to you is don't risk being ashamed or losing everything. Don't risk that. Just don't risk eternal life, sorry, because of that. Get it right. God will help you, but don't put your soul at risk. You, you cannot regain that. You cannot, when you die, you cannot come back and make amendments. If that ain't going to happen. That cannot happen. You have to get it right now. Just by accepting this, there's a whole world awaiting your arrival. There's so much that God has planned for your life. So many great things you are to accomplish here on this planet and to make the lives of others better. You, God has called to inspire, to motivate, to encourage, to aid, to assist, to, to reach, to places others bypass. But he's chosen you to make that difference. It's all wrapped up in your destiny. My advice to you, my friend, accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait for trouble to come. Don't wait for danger to come for you to say now, okay, God, I ready now. And the only reason why you're saying it is because you don't see a way out and your back is against the wall. So that means you're not coming with a pure heart. So I'm saying to you, accept the free gift of salvation. Tell me, what is it that you're going to lose? What are you saying? You can't fornicate no more? See, and all of that is a sinful mindset. Listen, let me tell you something here. Yeah? I can tell you from experience. <clears throat> the greatest relationship you could have with another human being in terms of uh, intimacy or being married or so on is to be with someone that you love married to, someone whom you only have intimacy with this one person and you love it with them. You don't want it with nobody else. I will, I don't care. We could be doing it for the next 60 years. It is only you that I want. I don't want to kiss and hug and become intimate with nobody else. I don't want to share my life with nobody else. I love doing life with you. That cannot happy, happen when you don't have a renewed mind, when you still out there in the world, because you're condemned, remember, if you're not saved. So in your mind, the enemy is going to say, why settle for one when you could have many? But you know just as well as I do, because I've been that road before. While you may have many, you are not happy. You are not satisfied. You're thinking about like all of us. I don't care how wicked we are. All of us sit down, get to ourselves at some point in life, sitting in a car on the stoplight, home alone, and we begin to do a self-introspection and we begin to look at our lives and realize this don't make no sense. I'm achieving nothing. I've accomplished nothing. I'm not safe. What if I die? What if I develop cancer? What if all of these things you're thinking? And God forbid if you don't have a savior to talk to or have a relation with relationship with to help you. You're going off your own strength, your own accord, which is limited. You have a devil that is working your brain 24-7, only interested in you defying the laws of God to secure your soul at the end of the day to eternal damnation. Is it is it worth it? No, it isn't. It isn't. So accepting this free gift of salvation, the next step is coming with the renewing of your mind and changing the way that you think. And let me tell you something, and, and I love to, I'm very open about my life because I'm one of those preachers, and I'm sure you know that by now. See, I don't, I don't, I don't ever come off like I was this perfect guy and I never fornicated and lie and cheat. Man, I am very open with that. I am, and I'm open because I want to show people I am a real person. I, as much as I'm gifted in the word of God, 
I wasn't always this way. I was just like the average person, or probably even worse. I was a womanizer. I was conniving. I would do anything to get what I want from a woman. That was me. But then Christ entered my life. And guess what? I still didn't change mentally. I still was fighting and dealing with those things. But like I said, salvation is progressive. As time went on and I stuck with the Bible and I stuck with praying. And some days I didn't feel like praying. Some days I didn't feel like fasting because I felt like I was going nowhere. Not having any knowledge of how the spiritual realm works. Meaning that while I may not have seen anything physically happening, there was so much going on spiritually. Because unknowing to me, by doing what the Bible was asking me to do, I was engaging laws that was giving predetermined results. But it was allocated for the future. So as time went on, I began to slowly lose my desire and feeling that I have to be with more than one woman. I, I, I was slowly losing that. And the fuck, I felt kind of strange. And then there was this changing of the mind that I, I want to be with someone, but I just want to be with anyone. I want to be with someone who, who, who into God, who, who really want to live for Christ, because I want to, I want to grow old with this person. I want us to enjoy life together and, and be married and do these things. And, and, and while this change, this isn't me is, and I know there was the Holy spirit on me, convicting me, but he was never a bully. He never pressured me. He never threatened me. And whenever I mess up, the conviction will come. And I felt uncomfortable. And I'll share something with you. I never shared this before. And I, and I think somebody needs to hear this. And the, somebody who needs to hear this is someone who's already safe. But you're constantly messing up. And I remember one time, I was in one of my evil acts again of uh, fornicating as a Christian. And I remember the lady saying to me, after we were done, she said to me, I thought you were a Christian. Literally. And, and you know how that felt to me? That felt like New Year's Day in Times Square, New York. And somebody had me on the highest stand and took all my clothes off and exposed me to everybody. When I tell you, when she said that, that ripped me apart. Because I told her I was a Christian. And here it is, I'm having sex with this girl. I wasn't married or anything. I was having... And I'm a Christian. And when I said that, that brought a piece of depression on me for at least three to four days. Because what it did, but I needed that. See, I need see, the Holy Spirit all along was convicting me, you know. But that there was the final injection. Now, did I stop fornicating after that? Not really, but it began to fade away because I was like, I, I cannot be living this double life. I cannot be doing this. And it was a fight. And that's why I say to people all the time. People who've accepted Jesus Christ, especially those of you who claim to be seasoned in the Lord, you must be patient with them like Christ was patient with you. Everybody have their battles. Somebody have some form of addiction, some form of, of vice in their life. Now, they have the tools now to fight it, but most Christians come along and rip the tools from them by judging them. So those people give up because they're not mature in the faith, and they figure, man, I can't do this no more, man. Let me just go back to where I'm comfortable at. And, and, and I, I don't I don't know. That shouldn't be. But that's only happening because you have people who are self-righteous around them. And, and every two minutes, the Holy Spirit tell them this. And the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit says, leave that man. Or the Holy Spirit say, don't go to that church. Or the Holy Spirit just told me this morning that you're getting ready to fornicate again. And guess what? The Holy Spirit just told me today, you stop lying. <laughs> but salvation is progressive. When I accepted Jesus Christ, I was reconciled back to God. I was guaranteed eternal life. And I'm now made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Guess what didn't change? This. That didn't change. My spirit was reconciled. My soul still battling with devices. That Those things didn't change. So now this is where it becomes even more progressive. This is where I work with my own salvation. Romans 12 and 2. Be not now conformed to this world, believers, the new converts of Jesus Christ, but now be transformed or be changed, believers of Jesus Christ. How? By the renewing of your mind. Therefore, by him saying that, you will still have the urges to lie, to cheat, to fornicate, to be deceitful, to be deceptive, to, to have side pieces. 
you were still going to have those because that didn't change. But now he's telling me how to change it. This is where salvation becomes progressive. Salvation is not perfection. It's progressive. So this is why I say to you, any preacher condemning those who are not saved and feel that by condemning and threatening them, that's going to bring them to Christ. If they do come, they came out of fear, but not for love of God. They came, but I don't want to go to hell. So I'm saying, yeah, I am saved. I ain't really believe it, but if that's what y'all want to hear, and if that ain't going to get me, if that ain't going to throw me into the hell fight, then I save. Let that person make the decision because they finally understand that I am in need of a savior. This life that I'm living is very much temporal. I may get 60, 65, 70 years out of this. But the truth is when I die, that's when living, true living begins. You know why? Because that's eternal living. Let me see how I could get things sorted out insurance-wise as it relates to the other side. Because i rather get the insurance by accepting Jesus Christ and dying. And you know what? Those things are not true. What I have to lose? Nothing at all. As opposed to not accepting Jesus, dying, and come to find out this hell thing is really real. But guess what? I can't back up out of it now. I'm trying to help you. So we have to be wise. Stop playing with God. Stop stop playing a form of God. Stop believing. And I see Christians do it all this time. Do, do, do you go to church? As if church makes you a better Christian. As if church makes you safe. No matter how much churches you go to, it is this personal relationship between you and God. I, I hate to say, but it's the truth. I have achieved more in God just by being home, doing what I'm doing, than attending churches. Now, again, this is not to say all churches are like that. But what I realize is that what is the purpose in going there? If you're going to be condemned, if no one is not teaching me the true gospel, if no one is not teaching me what I really need to be doing as a believer, is the Bible really a book of rules and laws like Kevin say? And if it is so, why are we not practicing it? And in, in other words, why are we uh, asking for exchanges for the miracles of God? Why do we have to do all these performances? Why can't we just do what this book says and get the promises of God? What is so difficult about that? When did we introduce this barter system? We exchange miracles for money. Where did that come in? See, all of these things we are going to be judged on. Okay? Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And let's look at verse 45. Listen what it says. For even the Son of Man, which is Jesus, came not to be ministered or serve unto, but to minister or to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, this is another nugget here. And Jesus was such a trendsetter. Jesus is the son of the living God. He's the second in the Godhead. He's the only begotten son. The book of Colossians says that everything that was made was made for him, by him, and without him, nothing was created. With that said, the scripture just said to us that this Jesus, who not only was creation, consists because of him, the same Jesus became a ransom or a sacrifice for us. But it didn't end there. In his glory, in his array of majesty, and every time I, I read these particular scriptures, I detest the black church, not all of them, most of them. What do you mean by that? The, the bulliness, the control, the arrogance, when this Jesus the creator of creation, creation was because of him, said, I didn't come here to be served, but I came here to serve you. Let me let this sink a little bit. Think about someone right now you greatly respect. I mean, when I say you respect them, this person you would do anything for. You would literally throw yourself on the ground for them to walk over thorns for them. And not in a worshiping manner, but this is your respect for them. Can you imagine this person who respect you so much? 
sorry, who, whom you respect so much in such high regard. And they say to you, Sandra, listen, I want to cook dinner for you. I want to do this for you. And you'll be like, no, man, you do this for me? Uh-uh, no, 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 I could never do that. You are a person of great style. No! No, 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 no. I'm here to serve you. Jesus, as usual, take it to another level. He said, Peter, here's what we're going to do. Go fill, go fill those little basins up with some water. I, Jesus, I'm going to wash your feet. What? Oh, no, Jesus. Now, see, Jesus, you're losing it now. Now, no, there's no way in this world am I going to allow the son of the living God, the creator of all creation, the cause of creation, wash my crusty foot? Never. No. Now, come on, Jesus. Now, you, you playing, right? No. No. So what is he really doing? Jesus, and you got to love him, that as great as he was, I think, listen, listen to me, listen to me. You all ready for this? The greatest person, in my opinion, outside of Jesus Christ, of course, human I'm talking, the greatest person, in my opinion, is, is two, two qualities they must have. Humility and self-control. To me, I, I don't know, I can't think of anybody else greater than such a person. You, you are endowed with power and wealth and all of that, but you have full self-control and you're humble about what you have. Man, you have my full respect. When I say full respect, listen, I, 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 you have my utmost respect. You're not exercising your authority on your sleeve and you, everybody got to know that you're the chief or you're in charge. In fact, when I come there, I thought you were a servant, not knowing that you were the one in charge. You don't see that today. You don't see that today. You don't see that today, buddy. And what is so sad is that most of these guys are in, and that's why a lot of them are crumbling and being exposed. And and, and the Bible says that it's in, in the book of Proverbs, it says, uh, what it says now, haughtiness, pride become coming, pride coming before falling, a haughty spirit, whatever, whatever. Anyway, it's in Proverbs, and it talks about the prerequisites to a poison fall, what has everything to do with arrogance and pride. And you don't see that in the sad part about it. I could see if they were so prideful and arrogant, and they were, I mean, had a bunch of miracles and and, and signs and wonders behind. They have nothing. There, there's no signs, there's no wonders, there's, there's none of that. And you prideful as if you're performing these things. But Jesus exemplified humility and self-control. Despite him being the son of God, despite him becoming flesh and dwelling among us. He, he listen, the more and more I think about it, I tell you, man, you, you have no much, how much I despise the black church. And not all, let me be clear. I'm talking about those charismatic devils, those demons, those Jezebelic controlling you have to be under their covering. If you leave their church, you will die. Foolishness, idiots. I have, when I tell you zero respect, I wouldn't step foot in such den of devils because they do not exemplify the control and humility of Christ. They behave as if when Christ left, he left them in charge of the entire earth. These are the ones who want to have the bride of Christ as their side piece. Right. You have to be under my covering and under my church and after under me. If you're not under me, you 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 are risking your life. How am I risking my life if I have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who gave me the free gift of salvation? And when I accepted the free gift of salvation, not only am I guaranteed eternal life, not only am I made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but I am the redeemer of the Lord. So, so where does your covering come in again? The same Jesus says, I will never leave you, Kevin. Neither will I ever forsake you. So, so, so if I if if I leave your church and if I'm not under your covering, so so what's going to happen to me again? Because the son is, if you have some greater power outside of the true covering, which is Jesus Christ, and this is why I, tell you, I despise the the arrogant. Let me say that. Let me be make me correct that. I despise the arrogant, powerless black churches. And if the white churches are like that, them too. I mean. You 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 tout all of this array of power, but you're powerless. 
Nobody's being healed in your congregation. Nobody's being delivered or set free. Everyone is broke because you're taking their monies every time you get an opportunity. There's no amending and restoring of marriages. Divorce is at an all-time high. And you're asking me to be under discovery? Why? I love my life. Why would I throw it away here? Never. Mm -mm. No. So humility and self-control for me, I'm very much attracted. I love to see people who are great in power, but you will never know because the way they handle it, they're humble. I had, a, I had a, my last boss. I, I always brag about him. Uh, Mal Malcolm Schweitzer, he, he was the personification of a Jesus-type leader. He was a servant leader, I, and I learned so much from him. I, a lot of what I do in leadership is because of him. A very powerful but humble man very self-controlled man. I admired that. That was, I, I, I glad God made him the last in my employment with a company as my leader because I learned greatly from him how to have self-control and to be merciful, compassionate, and, and to show care as great and as powerful as you may be. That's something, that's a lesson I'll never, never, ever, ever forget. Never. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Listen to what it says. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he came for. He didn't come to make you rich. He didn't come to give you Mercedes. If you follow the plan of God, these things are inclusive. You're going to worry about that. You, you will be well furnished if you follow. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Some translation says, and all of these things that you once ran behind will now come running behind you once you follow the protocols of God. All right? Let's go to John 10. John 10, verses 9 to 10. John chapter 10, verses 9 to 10. And it says, Jesus, that is, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You hear that in person, if you can hear me? <laughs> if you enter in, because you could be passing the door because you said, I don't need to enter in to go to heaven because what Christ did made me a Christian already, which is utter garbage. I am the door. By me, Jesus, that is, if any man enter in, he shall, not might, he shall be saved, past tense and shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief, the thief cometh not, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have this life more abundantly. So this is interesting now because the arena that this takes us into now is, like I said, salvation is progressive. And you don't just get saved and sit on your hands and think that the promise of God are going to overwhelm you. No. There's a lot of work that you have to do now, but the work is going to, the work that you're going to do in this preset, preset simply means that if I follow these rules in scripture, pertaining to my salvation, now that I'm the righteousness of God and the benefits that come along with it, each one of them have a predetermined, to, a predetermined end to my benefit. It's going to, every one of them is going to benefit me if I follow the rules, but I have to be adamant about the rules. So therefore, if you accept Jesus Christ now, if you have some time ago, the first thing you want to do is ask God to lead you to the right church. And the right church is going to be a church that is teaching the laws and the rules of God. Because like with anything you become a part of, you need to know the ins and outs. And the ins and outs is the policies and the rules that they operate by. Why? Because everything is governed by a law, a rule, and a principle. And you want to be guided the right way. Remember the church that I told you that I used to go many years ago? I started out in my mother's church. I know people there today still in the same position that we left them in. Why? Because the doctrine is not the doctrine of God. It will not cause them to excel. It will not cause them to go forward. In fact, by them practicing their gospel, it's laced with anti-progress, backwardness, delay, losses. But then they will say stuff like, well, child, the Lord, give it in the Lord, take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It all belonged to God anyway. So that is how they justify being comfortable in something that's not working for them. But again, they continue to do it. And that is what you call an addiction. Even though it's killing me, even though it's stagnating me, 
I'm still committed to jump on this again and continue and continue to do it. All right? So, now that you are not condemned, because the Bible says, and we read it in uh, John chapter 3, verse 18. In fact, I want us to quickly go there. John chapter 3, verse 18, because I want to make another point. John chapter 3, verse 18, and it says here, he that believeth on him, this is Jesus speaking, he that believeth on himself, Jesus Christ, is not condemned. Now, remember last night I left you in my ending statement. I said what I'm about to say next to bring us into today. And the Bible says that if you accept Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. But if you have not accepted him, you are condemned already. Meaning that you don't have to do anything to go to hell. By nature, you are bound for hell if you did not accept the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if I told you this before, but from 1980, 1992 to the year 2000, I worked as a part-time uh, funeral director. Now, I joined them because my brother died in 1992, but I was always curious for whatever reason, call me weird, I don't know. I was always curious about what they do with the dead, how they embalm them and all that other stuff. Anyway, I did that for a total of eight years. I discontinued it in 2000. And it was an experience that I'm happy that I, I took on because it really, it really, it really gave me greater depths and understanding of life and the appreciation of it. And one of the things that I took away from all of that over all of the years of assisting with the embalming and helping with the funerals and all that other stuff, what I learned was that, and this may sound rhetorical, but when a person is dead, that's it. That there's no coming back. There is no emotion that's going to come from them. There, there's none of that. None of that is going to happen. In fact, I'll tell you a joke. I remember the first day that I, I started working. I, it was part-time because I was still working at FedEx and I would normally work with them in the evening time if they had the bodies and definitely on the weekends when they had the bodies when I wasn't working at FedEx. And I remember the very first night, it was a Thursday night, I was requested in to assist with this this elderly gentleman. And I was nervous, I'm going to lie, because uh, it was uh, it was raining that night, storming actually. And even on the way there, was, I was really nervous, but I was really interested in to see how all these things operate. But anyway, the gentleman who I was assisting, we were in the embalming room together, and he had to go across, because it was like a, it was a two-part, it was the embalming side, and then there was a side where they would display the body, but they would also live on another part of it. It was, it was a residential site. So he had to go over there and do some stuff. So he left some little stuff there for me to do, like clean up or whatever. But anyway, this deceased body is on the tree. And we would normally have to wash the body off and so on. So anyway, while I'm doing what I have to do, the way that the body was positioned, and again, we had just washed the body off, this man, the hand slid off of the, the tree that he was on. Well, anyway, <laughs> this was so funny. I didn't even wait for that hand to completely end its journey when it came down because I took off so fast outside in the rain, okay? <laughs> Couldn't even find my key to get in my car trying to get out of the place. So anyway, all I hear is, Kevin, Kevin. So I say, yeah. <laughs> what, what you doing over there? So now that I'm that he is there, I feel more safe to go back there, right? So I, I said to him, I said, man, listen, I don't think this dude dead. <laughs> the truth is, he had to have been dead because we had all of his organs out and all his other stuff, right? But I ain't hanging around to figure nothing out because, oh boy, you should be dead. You There should be no moving over here. But the truth was, because it was wet, and of course, the 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 metal thing that was on, the arm slid. But again, I wasn't sitting down to have an analyze nothing and trying to draw some conclusion here. Let me draw my conclusions outside where it's safe. Because he shouldn't be moving. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Well, of course, he they made joke for, uh, for days with me. But I didn't care. I went in for safety. Because he's supposed to be dead. <laughs> dead people don't move. Anyway, when you are dead, that's it. It's at that point when you're that close with a dead body, that it was only due to a spirit that this person was able to interact, meaning their human spirit in that physical body that they were able to interact. 
And the reality of death is the separation of soul and spirit from that physical body. Because they're the two things that are housed in a human being that make that person exist on the planet. So death, no matter how a person die, plane, crash, motorcycle, accident, car accident, stabbing, shooting, everybody die from the same thing in this sense, whether it's cancer, lupus, whatever. You die because there's a separation of your spirit and soul from your physical body. And that's what determines death. And there's no more re-entry. So according to scripture, uh, the spirit goes back to God. The soul is what... Uh, depending on how you lived here on planet, whether you serve the devil or whatever, that goes to eternal life or eternal damnation. And the physical body, as what it was created from, goes back to the dust. But the bottom line is this. There is no more reaching out to that person. There's no more. You, they're never going to see that person cry again. You're never going to see them in pain. You're never going to see them laughing and enjoying. None of that. All that comes to an end. Now, what that did for me was... And again, during this time, I was growing more and more in my faith. Because remember, I got, I became a Christian. Well, actually, I became a Christian in 1996, which would have been two from six, four years after I started working with these people. But in my conversion and getting into the Word and dealing with this embalming and this stuff here, it gave me a greater appreciation for my faith. And, and what it also did for me is it brought to my understanding the finality, finality of death. There is no coming back. I'm saying all of that to say this. If you depart this earth and never accepted that free gift of salvation, it is all over for you. Now, I don't know where you are. I don't know if you are pending judgment to be condemned to eternal fire or you are there already in eternal torment and the truth is it doesn't matter it doesn't matter in the sense that it doesn't matter what i think but ultimately your decision is final whether you committed to god or whether you rejected the free gift of salvation because it all becomes real then all of the controversy, the YouTube, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Twitch, the t TikTok, and the interacting with friends. See, you're on your own now. And your friends aren't there to, to support you and to fight for you or to, to cheer you on. There's no more haters. There's no, none of that. All of what you do or did not do must now speak for you when it's time for you to stand before the Almighty God who knows all things. See, now... The reality sets in. Unfortunately, if this reality isn't working in your favor, you can't opt to go back to correct what you did not make right. This is eternal. In other words, you can't say, mommy, come help me. Daddy, big brother, cousin, friend, Bessie, besties. No, no you are on your own now. And every one of us will go through this. So with that said, is it worth it to every day of your life skating on thin ice, meaning that you have yet to accept the free gift of salvation? You want the blessings. You want the good husband. You want the favor. You want the healing. You want to be delivered, but you don't want to accept Christ. I want the benefits, but I don't want to commit myself to this Jesus guy. Why? But tell me why. Though. What, what is it? that is so great in your life and long lasting and eternal. Because it would make sense to me as if I could take this pleasure with me into eternity. And even while I'm being punished or not being punished, at least I get the joy of this pleasure, but you don't, you don't get to carry that with you. You don't get to carry the car and the house and the wife who have you been married to for 60 years. The only woman you know is her. But when you die, you don't carry her. You don't carry those children you love so much. You don't carry that baby boy who was born with, with, with uh, some disability and you had to care for this child while the other kids were grown and went off on their own. You still had to pamper this young child who was born a mentally challenged. But you don't care because this is your baby. And one day you got to leave this baby and you're flooded with the thoughts that who was going to take care of this child the way I did. But it wouldn't matter. Because your earthly duties and performances will all come to an abrupt end when you are hurled into eternity. 
was it worth it? Was it worth avoiding church, not reading the Bible, uh, condemning every preacher? I don't want to listen to him because they're all wicked, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what other alternative do you have? Because that's no excuse. God, I didn't accept you because Kevin Dose wasn't living right. T.D. Jakes did this. Carlton Pearson did that. So what? They're here too, and I have to give an account. So why are you why are you hedging your life around what they did and did not do when you have to stand before the throne of God and give an account? The Bible says in the book of Romans uh, 14 and 12 or 12 and 14, and it says that we are all accountable to God, all of us. Not a human being. You're not accountable to your pastor. You're not accountable to me. You're accountable to the all-seeing, all-knowing God. That's who you're accountable to. And what are you going to tell him? And he's going to show you, Kevin, look at the provisions I made for you. I've saved you from this accident. You should have lost your life over here. I protected you. I shield you all with the hope that one day you would accept the free gift of salvation. I healed you from your broken heart. I assisted you with the promotion. When everything, your back was against the wall, I sent people to aid to assist you just to show you that there is a God. And every one of the office of salvation, you turn your air. Now look at you. Your life tenure has been exhausted. You're now in eternity. And like I would have said in my word in Hebrews, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after his death, there's a judgment. There's no lawyers here, Kevin. There's no one here to defend you. There's no debating and arguing. All of that has been settled when you close your eyes from time and now you've opened them in eternity. You now have to face the throne of God. You now have to explain what did you do with your life? Who lives did you unpack? Why didn't you help those who were in a less position? You had the resources, Kevin. I gave it to you. Why didn't you help others who were in need? Why didn't you get your soul right? Why didn't you worship me? Why didn't you tell your kids about me? Why didn't you share the good news to other people? Why you yourself did not hear to those good news? There's no one to blame here now. No one to put. You cannot blame the government. You cannot blame the church. You cannot blame the preacher. You cannot blame mommy and daddy. You are an adult who made your own decisions. And the most important decision of your life, you abandon. And look where you are now. In a Christless hell. With eternal torment beyond your wildest imagination. How do we accept the free gift of salvation? So let's go to, uh, where is it now? I wrote it right up here. The free gift of salvation. I thought I wrote it down here somewhere. Did I? No, I didn't. Right. But anyway, the scripture says to us that if those that call upon the name of Christ shall be saved. Again, there are some people who will say to you, well, you are not saved if you are not baptized. That is not true. That is not true. Don't you ever believe that? Am I saying that you shouldn't get baptized if you have the opportunity? No, I'm not saying that. If you, if you, you should get baptized. But if you don't, that's not a requirement for heaven. All right? And that's easily proven, even though some people try to dispel it. Because we look at the crucifixion. There were three people on crosses out there. Jesus being in the middle, and the two guys on his left and his right. And one of them actually believed that he was Jesus. And he said, hey, Jesus, man, I, I want to hook up. 
And Jesus says, this day you will be with me in paradise, meaning that you come and you go, you can be straight. I didn't read any part of the story that Jesus asked the Roman soldiers, could you all please do me a quick favor? And you could put Mary back up here when you're done, but I just need to get down. And I need you to take this guy down because we need to baptize him so that he could meet the full qualification of salvation. You, you didn't read that, eh? No. After he would have said what he said to Jesus, they all died. Now, am I saying to you that you should not be baptized? No, I'll never tell you that. If, if I have baptized people, in fact, we do the marriage retreat in Jamaica next week. Uh, every marriage retreat or every single retreat, we always have a session of baptism where I'm leading that. But what I'm saying to you is that I don't want you to be getting caught up with these people. Then there's the same preacher that comes on again that you're not baptized if you're using in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit or if you didn't use Jesus. All baptism is, is a physical demonstration of what happened to you spiritually when you accepted Jesus Christ. It's the immersion in the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that I am now one in him because of my acceptance of him. That's all it is. It's no requirement that if I don't do it, I go to hell. So I don't want you to be caught up in those things. Don't be, the, the Bible says to you, avoid those foolish conversations. Th those things mean nothing. I don't want to hear you arguing, oh, you're going to hell if you don't do the Sabbath day and blah. Well, don't, don't get in those things. Like Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 23, by calling them hypocrites. He said, here it is. He said, you give of your tithes and your you cumins and whatever else, but you never ever deal with the heavier matters, the real issues. You don't get up, go caught up in those things. What is what is important while you're arguing, while you're arguing about the Sabbath day, while you're arguing about whether you should pay tithe and off, whether you, while you're arguing, there are souls being hurled into hell by the seconds. And some of those souls was in your company at some point that you should have shared the gospel with. But here you was over here arguing with this person who loved to debate over something that is not a requirement for eternal life. Now, if it was a requirement for eternal life, yeah, we need to be discussing this. The rich man came to Jesus, the rich young ruler, and said, Master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you need to do the Ten Commandments. So he says, which ones? He said, well, do all of them. You know, thou shalt not steal, blah, blah, blah. He said, man, I've done all of them, Jesus. And Jesus said to him, well, that is true. But this one thing you didn't do. Well, what is this, Jesus? Tell me, hurry up, so because I need to get up with this eternal life. He said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see that wine you get from Jerusalem. They spike that because <laughs> you're talking with your head now. <laughs> the Bible said the rich young ruler looked at Jesus and walked away saddened and grief, totally grief stricken by what Jesus told him. He couldn't grab a hold of that. Sell my material goods. Then Jesus goes on to say, and he makes an analogy out of what he says is, is, is difficult. For the rich, it would be very difficult for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I think one of the disciples said, but that's a very, very strong one. Jesus, well, well, what? Because the reason why is because, again, they're more committed to their material goods. They're more committed to their education. They're more committed to their status, which simultaneously says to me, they have lost the concept that all of these things are temporal. None of these things you could take with you in eternity. None of them. Absolutely none. You will leave it all here for other people to enjoy. What you work so hard for, fools may inherit and make a mockery over your years of committed hard work and labor. But it was all entrusted to you to be a steward over it. It was never for you to take with you. You cannot, you cannot take it with you. Bottom line, you cannot take it with you okay so let's wrap up here i'm trying to find these last uh these last scriptures let me see if i could pull this up very quickly and then we're going to end this right here and we're done
Okay, here we go. So, right, so that's the one I wanted to look at. Okay, so let's go to Acts 16, okay? Let's go to Acts 16, verse 31. That's why I figured where it was. So let's go to Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Okay. Let's start from verse 30. Acts 16, verse 30 to 31. And it says here, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be reconciled to God? What must I do to become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? But somebody says, verse 31 of Acts 16, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Listen, listen, and thy household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. All right? Let's go to Romans now. Romans chapter 10, okay? And we're going to read from verse 9 to verse 10. All right? This is what it says. Well, let's start from verse 8 of Romans 10. It says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, or close thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9 of Romans 10. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall believe in thine heart that God had risen him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So there's no such thing as, let me stop drinking first. Let me stop fornicating first. Let me stop lying first. Let me stop doing those things and then come to God. No, come as you are. But I know why you don't come as you are, because the minute you come as you are, they still condemn you. How dare she come in this church with this mini? How dare he come with his pants hanging below his hips? Mind you, the same people who told him, Jesus, they come as you are. And the minute you come as you are, they put a tongue lashing on you. And you know, the young people ain't got no patience, man. They say, I ain't got to put up with this. And they can say, that's the reason why they didn't come here to begin with. Verse 10 of, John, of Romans 10 says, For with the heart man believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you see, it's a two-step plan there. All right, But the whole idea here is to believe. That is what is key, to believe. All right? Let's go to, uh, and I'll be writing these scriptures down. Let's go to, let's go to, uh, where is it? I gave you Romans 10 already, right? Okay, so let's go to, let me see if this is in Matthew. Bear with me one second here. Okay, Matthew 10 and 22. Matthew 10 and 22 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved, meaning that no matter how much they hate you, no matter what they do to you, if you committed to believing that Jesus Christ is Lord, he says that if you believe in your heart and make confession with your mouth, you are saved through faith. I believe this. What that simply means, that there are several things that took place there, okay? But one of them did not happen, that I'm about to say. The, the three things primarily, I have been reconciled back to God through the only way, and that was through Jesus Christ. I have became the righteousness of God through Christ, uh, through through Christ Jesus. I'm not a redeem of the Lord. What did not happen is my mind wasn't renewed. That's a whole new different story, and this is where progressive salvation comes in. It's a continuous process. I need to be delivered from certain things. Okay. And the deliverance, people normally think deliverance is only for the wicked. No, there's deliverance for the just. The, 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 listen to me, let me put it this way. Every believer needs deliverance. Everyone, every last one. Everyone. 
This is what the Bible says. I quote the scripture all the time. Uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9b. And what does it say? It says, through knowledge now, through knowledge shall the just, which is the believer, be delivered. So he says, you the believer, there's some knowledge that you don't know, and it is what you don't know that have you in bondage. It is no different from when he said, and you shall know the truth, but it is this, this truth that you know and practice that will set you free. So he says, the, the believers also need, you need deliverance, believer, from lying, from being dishonest. You need deliverance from always competing with other members and will do anything to, to be ahead. You need deliverance. So as you can see, Christianity does not make you a perfect human being. And don't ever take on the idea that you are, you have become perfect. That is nonsense. You are not perfect. Okay? Which you are striving for. The, the Bible used the word perfect, but in the, what it means is maturity. Maturity in Christ. I had a lady wrote me one time, and she said, to me, she said, I was listening to one of your teachings and you said that no human is perfect. And she said, well, that's not true because the Bible talks about us becoming perfect. And if we discipline ourselves, we can be perfect. Okay, fine. You know what? I, I believe you. So let me, let me do me a favor then. Name me. I'm going to make it very easy for you. Very, very simple, ma'am. I'm writing her back. Of course, I never receive an email back from her. Can you name me? I'm going to be very generous with you. Name me two people right now that you know that are Christians, that are perfect. They don't sin anymore. They don't do no form of anti-God, nothing. Their thoughts are completely pure. They have no evil. Now, I don't know how you would know that. How do you get in their brain? But tell me two. I'm not going to say five. I'm not going to say ten. Tell me. Write me back and say, Kevin, these are the two people that I know that are perfect human beings. I'm still waiting. See, people like talk fool. So here's what I also said. I say, ma'am, I'm not here to fight with you or argue. I don't do those things. But like I reiterate into my teachings, always seek context. And in order to seek context, you must attain pretext as well as post-text to get context. Inclusive in getting this context, there are certain words such as perfect that you will come across in which this was the word best suited when it was translated from Greek or when it was translated from Hebrew. So what to do now, because we want context, go into the etymology or the origin of the original word to see what the true concept of the context is. But not because you saw the word perfect, you're saying now that a human can be perfect. And if that may be so, all I'm asking you to do is provide me with the evidence. Name me a human that existed or currently living that is perfect, never committed a sin after they came into the fullness of God, never had an evil thought, never had to cast down wild imaginations. All they thought was Jesus and kingdom and righteousness and never, ever entertain any form of... Show me them right now. Please. I want to meet this person because I could learn a lot from them. Am I saying we should be open for sin or not? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, relying on Jesus Christ's strength, because I can't do it on my own. If I was left on my own, I would be right back from where I began. I need this Jesus to help me, to aid me. I need the Holy Spirit to convict me. I need the Holy Spirit to, to, to desert and let me know, Kevin, don't take. And some days I might even disobey him. But I don't know where this woman coming from, because at the end of the day, Paul himself in Romans 7, Paul, who wrote, this man wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but yet I'm reading in Romans 7 how he is battling sin. Paul, who did all this writing, why wasn't he perfect? So, mom, if you're listening to me, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to show you up. I'm saying to you, 
rather than being a debater, rather than trying to say, let me show up, Kevin, please seek context. And in order to get context, you need pretext and you need post-text. You need to define certain words. You need to know who's speaking. Who are they speaking to? What is the core of the conversation? Who, who would they refer? Is it this just for them? Is it for people in the future? All of this you need when you want to stand, stand 10 toes down on. You can be perfect if you're a Christian. Christian oh, oh, no, this is what she also put in, my, in the email. She said she know that people can be perfect. It's just that they need discipline. Well, why? You're not perfect then. Here it is. As usual, you've got all this godly advice to give everybody else. Hypocrite, but you can't perfect perfection, but it is possible. <laughs> but you, two things, you are not perfect and you know of no one who is perfect, but you know, because the Bible said perfect, perfection could be attained in a human being. Well, then show it to me. Give me the proof. That's what I'm saying to you. And why are you not perfect? Seeing that you have the remedy to attaining perfection. No, I tell you, they, they just want to say, I, I, I can, let me refute. Let me show you. You're showing me up. <laughs> you're showing yourself up. Okay? So all I say to you, if a human being could attain perfection, all I am saying to you is show me how it is done. Because every day I need Jesus Christ. Every day I need him to inspire me. Some days when I get up, I don't feel like being a Christian. That's when I need him most. Some days I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like doing no fast. I don't feel like talking to nobody. I don't feel like counseling anyone. I am a human being like everybody else. I have emotions. I have feelings. There are days I feel down. There are days I feel uplifted. There are days I feel I can conquer the world. Now the perfection part of it, ma'am, I, I, I don't know. I, I still working on that part. Okay? So that's all I got to say. All right? So folks, that is it for me. Okay, we'll continue this. And I hope this was a blessing to you. I've given you more than sufficient scriptures to now go and work out your own salvation. If you accepted Jesus Christ, remember, it's not a end all. It's not a one-time thing. Salvation is progressive. While you've accepted Jesus, and, and we're going to go further into this in the next teaching, the Bible says, and it's speaking to those who have genuinely accepted him, okay? You are sealed until the day of redemption. And when people hear that part, they figure you could do what you want to do. You're bound for heaven. That's not the case. And we'll explain that for you, all right? So continue to pray for me. You guys have a blessed and marvelous Saturday evening. Continue to pray, like I said, for me as I pray for you.